Well, good morning and welcome to Wells Branch Community Church. My name is Chris Plegenpole, and I am so glad you guys are here. We are talking about uh, this morning the clean slate, and I am wearing a UT shirt today. Um, yeah. Well, see, my in laws gave me this shirt several weeks ago, and I was so excited to wear it. But we needed a clean slate after so much abuse by other football teams. And so tonight, or this morning, uh, after a 23 to zip victory for UT, I feel confident wearing this shirt. So we can give it up for UT. All right. That has absolutely nothing to do with our message today, but it was sort of a segue. All right. So we're in the book of John. Uh, and um, if for those of you who are just joining us, you're like, I haven't been to church in a while. What's going on? I'm going to give you a recap and review. Uh, John, the book, is all about really one thing and the thesis statement of John comes in chapter 20. Uh, and it says, Now Jesus did many things, uh, or many other signs, in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So chapter 1 uh, of John was all about John writing, how, writing about how Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And then John chapter 2, it was all about how Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So guess what chapter 3 is going to be about? It's all about that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Who knew? Right? Isn't this exciting? All right, so... Uh, so last week we talked about how uh, Jesus was cleansing the temple. Uh, he wrecked a little shop. And now uh, Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to get a visit this morning from a guy uh, named Nicodemus. All right? And he, they're going to talk about how it is that we get a clean slate. And um, the reality is, especially when we talk about football, uh, fo- like the NFL kind of needs a, a clean slate. Am I right? It feels like all the bad press, all the bad, like, Scandal, abuse, drugs, um, you know, child abuse, wife, girlfriend abuse. I mean, like, the entire thing is kind of, like, horrific from the lens of someone looking at it from the outside. And you're like, what is wrong with you people? And so what you guys need to do is kind of get your act together, get a clean slate started. But here's, here's the problem. Like, you convict somebody, you put them in jail for a while, and there's something that's got to happen on the inside. Am I right? Or else what's going to happen is that person's just going to do the same thing over and over and over again. Isn't that right? Uh, okay, let, let's, NFL, okay, that's not our world. All right, single people. Where are my single people at? Where you guys are? Yeah, all right. So here it is for a lot of you. Yeah, that's good. Greg is single and on the front row, FYI. All right. For a lot of you, listen, this is how your dating relationships have gone. All right, ready? Here we go. Uh, you, and I'm just use guys because this is the guy terminology. Guys will date a girl and then she becomes what? Psycho, right? And then you move on to the next girl, and that girl becomes psycho, right? I mean, and, and all of a sudden, you're on the third one, and she's psycho too, all right? And so what happens is this. Is, what's really going on is what's the common denominator of all three of those relationships? You, right? You. You're the psycho one, all right? I mean, I, and so what ultimately needs to happen is there's got to be some healing in your, in your life not so you can go find the right one, so that you can be the right one. And the right one always attracts the right one. All right, that's dating 101. That was for free. <laughs> How about this? How about this? For some of you, you have a boss, and your boss is an idiot, right? Okay. Ironically, the, the last boss you had was also a jerk as well. And then it just seems like every time you leave another job, you're at this other job, and you've got some pathetic people that are in charge of you, and you're just, every time you come home to your friends or to your wife or to your spouse or to whoever, you're just like, I got this jerk I'm working for. And like, you know, your spouse is really trying to be really in tune with you and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. That is, must be so hard. I don't know how you do it. Right? They're saying all the, making all the right noises. And but every time you go to work, you're so miserable. But it just seems like every time you find a new job, you keep getting cruddy bosses. What's the problem? Who's the common denominator? Just saying. It might be you're a bad employee. I'm just, I mean, the reality is we've got to, at some point, we can't keep blame shifting and making everybody else responsible for our own junk. Am I right? I mean, listen, I, and 
Don't get me wrong. I, listen, I know that people have been hurt. I, I mean, I, I counsel people, and they are abused. I mean, people have been abusive to them, and it's been hard. And so what happens is hurt people do what? Hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And so what happens is that a hurt person just kind of passes on, you know, because it definitely rolls downhill. You get it, and you're just passing it on. And so what happens is that never, there's never a chance for a clean slate. And you want to know why? Because every time you go to a new job, every time you go to a new relationship, you still bring all your baggage with you. And so this morning, um, I want us to talk about how we can get a clean slate. And I know there's some of you here, um, and you're like, Chris, this does not apply to me. I'm good. I'm sure there's some other weirdos here that have issues, uh, but not me. I am OA okay. And I, listen, I have been where you're at, all right? So um, when I first started going to church, I was 22, I went to this massive, ma- it was like 30,000 people there. It was glorious. And we sat in pews. Pews are long chairs that are connected to each other. So like, there's no separate chairs. And so I would go and I'd sit in one of these pews and I would listen. And at the end of the church service, uh, there would be people walking down the front to the front to give their life to Christ. And uh, this is my real thought. I'm I'm not like, no filter here. Those people must be really screwed up. I mean, they must really need some help. And they'd be crying. And the worst that they were crying, I just thought, oh, that guy's a sinner. Right, I mean, I, like in my head and in my heart, I was judging everybody that would kind of do that thing, and I was like, "Man, you'll never get me to go down there." I mean, and, and, but on the inside, on the inside, I'd see all these people crying. They'd be like happy, they'd be like laughing and crying all at the same time. I thought it was just the most bizarre thing I had ever seen. I was like, "What is wrong with these people? Did they, like they take something before they came here? Now they're just like out of control." I mean, what's really going on? Until I started to feel that inkling that maybe there was something wrong with me. So. Listen, so for those of you who are like, I don't need this because I'm already put together and I'm perfect, um, just listen, all right? Just give me, you know, take another 38 minutes and just hang with me, all right? All right, so we're in John chapter 3. And uh, if you don't have a Bible this morning, we are going to do some Bible work. So everybody needs to have a Bible or one on your phone or something. Raise your hand in the air if you don't have a Bible. One will come to you. If you don't have a Bible at all, this is our gift to you. Thank you for coming. And uh, I want you to enjoy this Bible. Take it home. Write your name in it. Do whatever you need to do. And uh, if you, like, this is time to get your pen out because we're using pens today in our Bible because I'm so excited. This is like, the, very rarely will I make, make you write in your Bible. But this is one of those days because I'm so pumped about this message. And it could be because I got an energy drink from Greg. And I had some coffee on top of that. But it could be that the Bible, it really is that awesome. All right? Here we go. We're in John chapter 3, verse 1, and action. Now, they, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. All right, pause for your, my non-church people. Uh, Pharisees were like religious leaders. Um, so think like priest type guys and they had studied and in a world of illiterate people they had were well read and they could quote chapter and verse of just about everything uh, religious and they were leaders and this guy's named Nicodemus and he is a ruler of the Jews so that means he's got high influence he's a high power guy and so um, he's a man of influence now the reason this is important is that Last week, you may remember, Jesus starts, you know, he you know, throws over the temple and like overturns tables and he's throwing things around because he is cleansing the temple because they had turned worship of God into worship of profit. And by profit, I mean like they were looking to make some money. Yeah, who knew? Like religious people trying to make money off poor people. Who would have thought that would ever happen? And so here's what happened. He, Jesus gets fed up with that. He calls out the religious leaders and the rulers of uh, the area, and he says, you guys are wrong, and he, th- he makes thousands of people leave the temple. He, make, he clears out hundreds and hundreds of animals. I mean, it was a bizarre moment they had never experienced. And so this, and Jesus confronts the religious leaders who's like, hey, whose authority are you doing this? So it's, uh, Nicodemus is coming from those guys, and he's coming at night, that we're gonna find out, because he really wants to get to the heart of what Jesus is all about. Watch what he says. So this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. So he's coming to him with a respectful, like, hey, I'm not coming here to, like, you know, do a little jab for what you did earlier in the temple, made us look bad. 
He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So there must have been some sort of miraculous uh, cl- healing, cleansing, uh, you know, maybe even some exorcism stuff going on. Jesus made an impact. It wasn't just the moral authority that he had to kind of like, you guys are corrupt. Get out. It was also that he had some supernatural things going on with this guy. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, Jesus changes the subject, and Jesus always does this. Jesus never wants to talk about what you want to talk about. He wants to talk about what he wants to talk about. So Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. All right, we're going to pause right here. Everyone to close your eyes for a moment. When I say the term born again, what do you see? Okay, open them. For some of us, the term born again has some negative connotations. Like we think of people like picketing certain places and having lots of signs and screaming at people. And uh, so I want to, let's wipe the bias away and let's just hear it from Jesus before all of our bias kind of came into the picture. All right, so Jesus is introducing a term here that Nicodemus has never heard before. He said, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus goes, what? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he, now this is the part where you just want to, it's like, whoa, Nicodemus, that's kind of weird. This is a creepy question. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus keeps it moving. (laughs) Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's going to kind of re-say that same phrase using different words. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So in other words, when you're born of water, you guys ever heard of like your water breaking? So when you're born, water comes with the, the deal. It's messy. I've seen it. It's not just water, by the way, in case any of you guys were wondering. All right, so there's this physical birth, right, with the afterbirth. I'm sorry. Anyway, there's this physical birth, and then all all this stuff comes out, and you're completely flesh, right? Then he's saying there's a different birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's completely different from the first birth. And then he says, listen, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is taking this all in. And Jesus keeps going. He said, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. In other words, when you are born of the Spirit, you don't know exactly what happened to you. You just know something did. Like you're like, I don't know, one day it was like another day and all of a sudden like life went from black and white into vivid color. I don't know what happened. I can't explain to you at all. All I know is that life is different. I now believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead. I am now born again. And see, in fact, this is what, this is what uh, Jesus is really saying here. He said, a clean slate is required to enter God's kingdom. Why? Why is that? Let's, let's just talk about issues. Let's talk about our issues for a second. Let's talk about why you have issues uh, with your spouse, okay, right? So for some of you, um, you might say, you're acting just like my mom. Stop doing that to me, right? All right so like we, I'm sure some of you have had that conversation, awkward. And uh, like some of you have said, you're being just like my dad. And then it's, you know, another fight goes on because you just compare it anyway. So like we've got tons of fights that happen because of our parental issues, right? How do you erase those? You got to be born again somehow, right? You got to somehow redo all the stuff that kind of got messed up in your child rearing or child raising, which is why with Austin, we're just like, oh my gosh, we got to get this right. I mean, I don't want him to come out with issues, right? Because we all have issues. And even as great as my parents are, I still have issues. So do you. Just saying. But, but here it is, here it is. So what has to happen for a clean slate? You got to be born again. Okay, and obviously we're saying you can't go be born again, you've got to be spiritually reborn. And this is where we're going to go with this. Uh, this week, I got one of these, you know, I get strange things happen to me pretty much on a regular basis because I guess I'm a magnet for strange things. But anyway, so uh, here's what happens. I was, you know, Adrian and I were chilling and I get a phone call from a number I don't recognize. So I do what you do. I screen the call and I just do a text, like the auto text back of like, sorry, I can't talk right now. Uh, what do you want? 
And I, I get a, the text comes back, is this Chris Pleckenpole? And I'm like, yes, it is. She goes, okay, thanks. Or the, the text goes, okay, thanks. And I'm like, who is this? And the person comes back, this is so-and-so's wife. And I'm like, oh, I know that person. I've, uh, some time ago, I counseled them on uh, their marriage. So I'm thinking, oh, they're wanting to kind of, you know, they're separated. Maybe she's wanting to, you know, talk to me to get back together. I'm like, hey, let's talk. And, and the, she goes, why? <laughs> and I go, I think I can help. Okay. And so I'm thinking, wow, all right, we're right on the right track. This is going to be like marriage counseling 101. Boom, boom, knock this thing out. So the following afternoon, uh, I, I give this person a little jingle jangle. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? Um, how can I help? And she's like, well, you're a lawyer, right? And I'm like, uh, no, no, I'm not. Um, I've seen some played on TV. I could probably do my best at legal advice. Um, but uh, aren't you... Didn't you call me to kind of get things right with your husband? She's like, no, I thought you were a lawyer, so we could kind of just expedite this divorce. I'm like, hold on. Um, I'm actually a pastor. She's like, how are you a pastor? Your name's written on my divorce decree. That happens sometimes, you know. And I go, well, they'll tell me what the issue is. And for some reason, she just kind of opens wide open. She's like, well, and then she goes into it. Like, my husband and blah, blah, blah. And do you want some more evidence? My, and then she goes, situation after situation after situation after situation. I'm like, and I'm like, now I'm looking for my exit strategy on this one. And I go, can I pray with you? <laughs> um, you know, we'll pray, amen. And then I'm like, oh, it's great talking to you. I'm sorry I couldn't be any help. And she's like, no. I won't pray with you. And I'm like, I got nothing. I don't, I don't know what to do. Well, well, what can I do with you? Well, I want to tell you about all. And she just goes on the litany of things that why this guy was like the worst person on the planet. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry. And what she was touching on, she said that she's like, I'm so paranoid. I can't trust anybody. I'm angry. And I said, listen, and this is where I started, you know, being pastorally. I said, there's something wrong, right? What is your connection with God like? So I, what does that have to do with my connection with God? This person ruined me. And just like the anger started to kind of well up. And I've done my fair share of marriage counseling. So one of the things I kind of noticed in what she was saying is that she was putting, um, she, what she was describing was what's called spouse worship. All right, There's this point at which you can worship your spouse. And what I mean by that is you put that person on like this like a platform or a pedestal, and they are not allowed to do anything wrong. And um, you can, like, scream at them, yell at them, and then you go, you're supposed to forgive me, because that's what God would do, right? I mean, like, you just get angry, all fired up. You're like, forgive me. You're supposed to forgive me now. And the person's like, whoa. And it becomes complicated. And what has happened is that the identity of that person has been firmly rooted in their spouse, and they've kind of just done this thing of worship. So what happens when the 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 person that is worshiping their spouse doesn't get what they want, they start to manipulate their spouse and they start to control their spouse because their spouse needs to be able to be worshiped. And so they'll start to do things and say things and it becomes a super painful relationship. And so when I started to describe that to her, she's like, I have become that. My spouse did that to me. And now I do that to other people. I start to manipulate people. I start to try and control people. I'm paranoid of everybody. I don't trust anyone. And just like the anger is just going forth. And I was like, listen, what you need is a clean slate with God so that you can have a clean slate with people. It's like, what are you talking about? I said, the reason why you're acting out so hurt, the reason why you're, you're so angry is because there's something missing and it can't be fulfilled by a spouse and it can't be f- by fulfilled by any person. Only God can fill this thing that's empty your soul. Like, no, I'm angry. He's hurt me. I said, stop, stop, stop. Listen, we got to first address the hurt in the heart where you need healing. You need a clean slate with God. You see, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. And if you would like to receive him, he will fill you up so only God will satisfy you so that when you look at your marriage, you see it as a ministry opportunity, not as someone who has failed me, although that might be fully true. And just kind of, she sat there and listened. She's like, I'm listening. (laughs) 
All right. I said, well, here's, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you. So like, well, we are sinners. We, like, have you ever done anything wrong? Well, maybe once, you know. It's like, all right, good. Kind of established that we're all on the same page here. And what Jesus did, he came from heaven to earth and he died on the cross for our sins and then he rose from the dead. And if anyone believes in him, he won't perish, he won't die, he'll have eternal life. And that healing that happens between you and God will then make you able to have a relationship with people. I said, I'm going to pray this prayer. Do you want to pray it with me? She said, no, but I'll listen to the prayer. (laughs) All right. All right. We'll work on that. We'll get there. I said, all right, it's going to go like something like this. You know, Father God in heaven, I confess that I'm a sinner. Sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, my actions. I haven't loved you with my whole heart. Father, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and he rose from the dead. Holy Spirit, come into my heart and make me the person you want me to be. I said, did you pray that? She said, I don't know. I said, why don't you think about it? She said, I will. All right, if you know, if you have any other questions, you got my number. Okay. This is the weirdest conversation I've ever had. I thought you were a lawyer. Goodbye. And I'm like, there we go. I mean, it was, it was just, I mean, you know, that, that happens. That's the day of my life. Because here it is, here it is. It's, it's when you think that you can fix things by getting a new start with people, ultimately what you're doing is just, you're covering up pain. When I would move, I used to move a lot in the military, and I'd move to like the new place, and I got to be whoever I wanted to be. It was great. And as soon as people really got to know me, I'd move again anyway, so it didn't really matter. And if I messed up a couple of relationships, they're like, all right, see you guys. And I'd start over somewhere else. I'd do the same thing. And I'd be like, man, how do I keep getting here? And it's because I didn't address the baggage that was dragging with me everywhere. I needed a clean slate. And to get a clean slate with people, you got to have a clean slate with God. Because that's what's required to enter into his kingdom. All right. So Nicodemus looks at Jesus and he's kind of confused. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you not the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? It was kind of like a backhanded, like, um, you're supposed to be the guy with the degree, and you're supposed to be teaching this. This is like religion 101, my man, come on. Truly, truly, I say to you, We speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Now, I'm thinking Jesus is being a little hard on Nicodemus because I'm sitting there going, what are you talking about? I mean, this concept of being born again, I mean, who has ever heard of that? And for me, this, this was one of those things that when I first started reading the Bible, I I got got kind of skeptical because I'm like, all right, Jesus, you kind of made up this thing about being born again and like a spiritual rebirth. And I had really a problem with that. Like, show me where it says that in the Old Testament. And then I went to seminary. And this is the most cool thing I have ever seen. All right, like, remember how I told you, like, I very rarely I'm mean, like, I jump up and down. Like, this is my jump up and down time about the Bible. You guys ready? You guys ready? I need everybody to go to Psalm 87. Very rarely will I have you skip across the Bible, but it's this cool. Psalm 87, I think it's page 494 in your Bible. And the Bible that we passed out, you might have a different version, so don't go to 494, go to Psalm 87. All right, so here it is, watch. This is so cool. Like, how does this concept of being born again, where does it come from? If you didn't know, the Psalms were written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus even shows up on the planet. Because whenever I read born again, it's like, that's convenient, Jesus, you kind of threw something you made up. No, watch, here we go. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. This is Psalm 87, verse 1. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. What's the city he founded? Which one is that? Jerusalem, all right? Jerusalem. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. What's another name for Jerusalem? Zion. What's another name for heaven? Zion. It's kind of like a dual meaning thing here. The, love, the Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. In other words, he likes being a door greeter. Like he hangs out the door and he's excited. Why does he hang out the door? Because he's excited? Because he made everything that's in the city of Zion. The city, the holy city the heavenly city. He's excited. Now, so far you guys are not impressed. I can tell. It's okay. More than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Jacob's another name for Israel. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Selah. Now, whenever you read the word Selah, that means pause, reflect, think about what you just read, and meditate on it. So, all right, so God really loves the gates of Zion more than any other part 
of heaven. Okay, so everyone's kind of just pondering that. Like, okay, cool, God's really into being a doorman. Why? Because he loves all the things that are in it. Now watch this next verse. Blowing your mind. Here we go. Those who know me. I mentioned Rahab and Babylon. Now, Adrian used to have a cat named Rahab. And I always wonder, like, what is, is that like Rahab the cat? No, Rahab is another name for Egypt. Okay, just in case you guys are wondering, write that in your Bible. Rahab equals Egypt. So just a kind of antiquity name. So Rahab equals Egypt, and Babylon equals Babylon. Now, let's think of a certain country that enslaved the Jewish people for 400 years. Egypt. All right, good. We're, all right, so just in case you didn't know that, Egypt enslaved the Jews for 400 years. Let my people go. Moses, remember that? Okay, that was Egypt. Okay, now Babylon, watch this. They exiled the Israelites for 70 years. So these are like on the top two guys of not, our, not fans. We are not fans of Egypt. We are not fans of Babylon. They do bad things to our people. Okay, how about this one? Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. Philistia. All right, do you guys, you guys ever heard of David and Goliath? Okay, good. David and Goliath. Goliath was a Philistine. All right, nine foot tall dude who could, you know, just kill people with a single punch. I mean, he was... And so what the Philistines, when they go to battle, they all stand behind Goliath and say, fight our guy, fight our guy, fight our guy, and die. And they woo! And it was kind of a fun thing. And they just would call out, give us one guy to fight Goliath, and then we'll, you'll be our slaves. And so out runs David, wham, throws a little slingshot rock, plants it in his head, comes over, chops off his head, done deal. And then the Philistines ran. There was many battles with the Philistines. They were an enemy of God's people. All right. Next one is Tyre. Tyre, uh, they're in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, Tyre is compared to Satan. That's not a good rap, uh, just in case you were wondering. Like, you know, we, we have Sin City. That's, that's probably a bad rap for Vegas. Uh, but to be just be like flat out, that like Satan City, you hang out there, that's Tyre. All right, and the last one, Cush, were other enemies of Israel. So like, these are all the bad guys. And they all surround Israel. All right, for right now, Israel, like if you go to Israel like right now, they're, like a lot of people are trying to kill him. And so it's kind of like that. It's like all the people that wanted to kill Israel, he's writing it. So among those who know me, like who have a relationship with me, I mentioned Egypt, Babylon, which would be Persia, Philistia, Tyre with Cush, all of who would be bad guys. And this part is the mind-blowing part. This one was born there, they say. What? Right, if, you're, if you're born in Egypt, how can you be born in Zion? You would have to be born again. This one was born there. And they say, and of Zion it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the most high himself will establish her. Like he will make these people born again on his own accord. The Lord records as he sits at the gate and registers the people, this one was born there. Selah. Think on that. To me, when I read this, it was like tears streaming down. I was so excited. It's like, oh my gosh. Jesus didn't just pull this idea of being born again out of thin air. It was something that has always been in Scripture, but just no one bothered to read it. This concept of being born again, the enemies of God. Think about this. Those who were enemies of God would be reconciled and they'd be all one. I mean, some of the most beautiful things that I've ever read. You want to know why? Because, and you, you should know this too, like, I've been an enemy of God. I've been like a person that was rejected God, rebelled against God, went my own way because I wasn't born of Zion. I wasn't born heaven. I was a born American. Americans have our own issues. I got my own issues. I got my own pride. I got my own lust. I got my own greed. I got my own stuff. I was born that way. I was born that way. But it says here that to be of Zion, you've got to be born of Zion, and somehow God is going to do that. God will make you born again. And that, to me, is one of the most exciting things that I've ever read, and it makes for me the scripture be like, wow! Because watch, here it is. Watch, watch he's going to lay this on onto Nicodemus. Ready? Here we go. It said, no one, verse 13, back on John, turn back to John, page 888. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. 
the Son of Man, another name Jesus loved to use of himself. So the Son of Man is Jesus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, for some of you, you're like, okay, what's up with the snake? Uh, you know, I, I've heard about you guys in the mountains with the snake handlers, all right? So not the same thing, okay? Here it is. So back in the day, as Moses and the Israelites were leaving Egypt, they, you know, tromped around the desert for a good 40 years, like vacation, desert vacation. And on one particular day, they upset God, made him a little upset, and he put a plague on the people. And everyone is dying, and, the, and Moses cries out to God, God, hey, um, we got to save these people. They're dying. And so he says, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this snake on a pole and put it in the middle of the camp. And anyone who looks at that snake on the pole is going to be healed. Now, where have you seen a snake on a pole recently? Hospital, ambulance, anywhere with like medical things. Kind of neat, huh? All right. And so what he's saying here is like, as... As it was so simple, all you had to do was stick a big pole in the ground that had a snake on it. Anyone who believed that they were sick enough and that they needed healing, they would come and look at the snake and they'd be healed. And so Jesus said, I'm going to be lifted up on a cross. And anyone who comes and just looks on me and they believe, they're going to be healed. The brokenness, the destruction that they've experienced in their life, it's going to be healed. You see, clean slate comes through believing Jesus died upon the cross and rose from the dead. And listen, we're not talking like you need to go like dig down deep and really try really hard to believe. It's not like, I just got to believe. No, no. I mean, how much faith did it take those Israelites to look at the snake? They're like, I'm sick and I'm broken. I need help. Where's the snake? I don't care how dumb it sounds. I'm going to look at a snake and get healed. I'm going to go look at the snake. Healing. It takes that much faith. Because here, let's talk about the components of this faith. One is you got to understand how broken and like you are, you're plagued. You are plagued. And that God is offering you a way, and all you got to do is look. How much effort does it take to look? You don't got to be athletic to look. You don't have to do much to be able to look. You just got to open your eyes and look towards Jesus. Not based on your effort, not based on your work. It's all on your ability to say, like, I got nothing else. I'm looking at Jesus. Heal me. That's how you get a clean slate. And that's how simple it is. I think a lot of us, we want to make it so complicated. Remember when I, when I was talking to that lady on the phone, and I kind of laid it out for her. I said, this is the prayer. I mean, it's a simple prayer. You can write down this prayer, but just you writing down the prayer doesn't mean anything. It's the attitude of your heart. Your attitude of your heart has got to match the words. I confess I'm a sinner. I'm, I've got a plague. I believe that you're the only way I can be healed. Heal me. Holy Spirit, heal me. That's it. That's all it takes. Your attitude of your heart, just looking up at God going, I got no answers. You are the only one who can heal me. Please heal me. And this next verse is like... Um, You've seen it at football games everywhere. This is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the whole world, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus comes because out of love. And for some of you, are like, well, I haven't seen a whole lot of love out of you Jesus people. All I get is some condemnation. Is that what Jesus brought? He said, no, Jesus didn't bring condemnation. He brought us to save us. He wants the world to be saved, not to condemn the world. He wants to save the world. But watch this next line. This is the part that people get confused by. For whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But here's the hard part, ready? But whoever does not believe is condemned already. You've got the plague. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Because we were natural born sinners. And in the darkness of our hearts, we simply do what dark-hearted people do, sin. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. See, God's desire is for all to escape condemnation and receive a clean slate. He wants everybody to receive freedom. Remember, so for me, remember in those big chairs called pews? I would sit there and I, my heart would be like, I want whatever those people are getting, but I don't want anyone to know or think, really think, <laughs> that I might have something really wrong with me. Because I was so afraid people would judge me. I'm like, just like you are. I don't want anyone to think bad about me. I like people liking me. We've talked about this before. So on December 4th, 99, that was my day. I'll never forget it. I, fa- I finally came sick and tired enough. I didn't care what people thought anymore. I didn't care what they knew about me. I didn't care. <laughs> I mean, I sort of cared, but... I mean, I was sitting in the back row. I mean, tears are streaming down my face. I'm like, why am I crying? Why am I crying? What's going on with me? I'm like, and like my heart wanted to explode on the inside. I was like, there's something wanting to jump out because I, I want what everybody else seems to have, but... It's scary to take, and like people are bawling their eyes walking down. And so my thing was, I didn't want anyone to see me crying, so I sprinted down. The, like it was like you know about a hundred yards of sprint, and I'm like you know by the end I'm sweating, laying on the ground, bawling my eyes out because for the first time I got it. Like life went from black and white to color, and I didn't care what people knew. I didn't care. I just wanted a clean slate. I wanted to escape the condemnation that went on in my head. I wanted to escape the condemnation that went into my actions, the way I hurt people. And I got it. I got it. You see, that's the hard part about thinking you have a clean slate. Or or thinking you've got at least together enough. Like, that's where we say, like, you know, how do you get to heaven? Well, you know, I'm not that bad. I do pretty good stuff. I mean, I'm like, I work hard. I pay my taxes. And, you know, I don't cut people off. And I stop at red lights. I mean, what, what else do you want? What God wants is your worship. What he wants is to break you from that self-protection, that self, I've got it together. Listen, there is nothing you could tell me that I'd be like, you're too far out of God's love. Nothing, nothing, nothing you could say would take you out of God's range to love you and give you amazing grace. You can't. You know how, and this is like, I'm a pastor, so I struggle with this. I don't want anyone to think I've got issues, right? Adrian's my wife, and, you know, we're like pastor, pastor's wife, and so we can't have issues. But we do, right? We, we are like a normal married couple. And we have normal married couple problems because we have a 16-month-old. A and our 16-month-old, Austin, uh, has reflux, teething, and night terrors. And so on, a, a, on this past week, it was hard. I mean, it was like a lot of tears, a lot of crying, a lot of like, I don't think I can make it. I don't, you know, I just want to quit on life. And Adrian's not a person that tells anybody, you know, her problems or issues very freely. Uh, and this week, she got on the city. If you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say on the city, wellsbranchchurch.com, get connected to the city. All right. That was a free plug on that. Get on board. Get on board. All right. And she writes this email or this post and says, listen, my son is sick. I don't know how to heal him. We've been to the doctors a billion times. Would you pray? You see, Adrian, I was so proud of her in this because I was like, you, you've just done the very thing that we try and get everybody on the planet to do is get over yourself and ask for help. Because you know what? Here's your deal. You don't want anyone to know your deal because you don't want anyone to have to help you. You don't want to be a burden on anybody. That's what church is for so that you can be a burden on somebody. That's what we do. We carry people's burdens. And when Adrian did that, listen, I mean, like she's like crying about how many people responded. She's like, she couldn't believe it. Did you know these people actually care? I was like, yeah. That's kind of why we have a church. It's a family of believers committed to reaching people with the life changing around Jesus. I mean, that's what we do. And so whenever she was able to kind of see that, it was like, it was healing for her soul. Man, it was powerful. Listen. She got over her fear of what people would think when she wanted her son healed. you got to get over yourself if you want healing. 
And that's why every time when we sing the songs, there should be this something palpitating in your chest saying, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. That means whenever like Grayson comes up here and we are ultimately uh, pushing this thing of like, you've got to come to know Jesus. That's why we do that. Can you hit the last slide? When we do that, what we're asking you is for you to receive, escape condemnation and receive a clean slate. And this is what I want you guys to do. Can you guys get out your bulletin or anything to write on? Bring out your phone, something. And I did my best slate drawing. This is from our playroom. And I wrote John 3.16 here. For God so loved, and I put a blank right here. I want you guys to do the same thing. Wherever you're writing, you could do this on your phone or whatever. For God so loved, blank, that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I want you guys to write that down. Would you do that? Would you write that down? I know that's a weird thing to ask. And here, if you have never received God's gift of forgiveness, I want you to write your name in the blank. For God so loved Chris that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And I want you to experience the freedom. I want you to experience what it means to be born again. I want you to experience what it's like when you like, finally like, breathe and like, you like looking at trees and colors and you're like, wow, did you see how great this place is? Look what God has done. I want you to experience that. Now listen, um, if you already know Jesus, then I want you to, uh, don't cross your name out, <laughs> but I want you to write somebody else's name in. I want you to write somebody else's name that you know that could that, need, that God's desire is for that person to escape condemnation and receive a clean slate. So just write that person's name right next to yours. And then I want you to take that piece of paper or that, turn it into a text, and then I want you to send it to them. Because I want you to care enough about somebody to tell them the hard, amazing, awesome truth that God loves them And it might be an awkward and weird conversation and you might feel weird for it, but man, they're plagued. They need healing. And all they have to do, it takes minimal faith. Just look, look, tell them to look. I'm telling you, look, all you gotta do is look at Jesus and he'll save you. And for some of you listening, like I don't know any uh, non-Christians um, good news is there's a bunch of non-Christians here, so hallelujah. Thank you guys for coming. So go meet somebody here today at some point. But if you don't know anybody, I want you to, or you might know somebody, that, but you don't know them well enough to have that awkward, weird, hey, I just randomly gave you a piece of paper, I randomly sent you a text, then I want you to write their name and I want you to pray and ask God to give you the courage because you've got, you've got the remedy for their sickness. And you've got a healing for their soul. And they're waiting for someone to tell them about something they didn't even know was wrong with them. And then you know what's going to happen. Is their slate is going to be wiped clean. And they get a brand new start with God. And that's going to give them a brand new start with people. As they experience the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ. Would you guys pray with me? Father, um, you are doing more than we can ever hope for or ask in people's lives. And God, this morning, I am praying that you would transform somebody from the darkness to the light, that they would receive healing God, they need healing. And Lord, would they for the very first time just receive Christ in their heart, that maybe they'd be born again, no matter what sort of lifestyle they're coming from, no matter even if they want to give up that life or whatever, just, Lord, would you just change their heart first to be born again and renewed and have a kingdom life? God, please open up their hearts so they can see. And God, I'm praying for those of us who have 
received that new life, that had been born of Zion, born of heaven, and we've left the old country, America, and we have got a brand new life in yours. Lord, would you give us the courage to reach out to somebody as an ambassador and say, listen, you don't have to live like this. You can have a brand new life, even if your self-image is horrible, even if your marriage is terrible, even if your single life is a train wreck. It doesn't matter. God, please, give people new hearts. Give people courage to give new hearts. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Imagine what would happen if the, the weight was lifted off your shoulders. Imagine what would happen in your own family if you didn't stop trying to control and manipulate the other person. In other words, you were trying to give grace like you received. Oh, man. That would change your family. That would change your workplace. Instead of w working for an idiot, you might be ministering to one. <laughs> Imagine what would happen to this city if we became a people who just love, love, love others because out of the overflow of grace that we've received, what would happen to your family, to this city? It would change the world. Would you receive the benediction? Go and be a people who have a clean slate. Go and be a people who are born again. Go and live out the freedom that you, which you have received and treat others like people who need to hear the good news that they don't have to be sick anymore, that they can be healed and forgiven. Go and push back the darkness and have an awesome week of worship.